Why don't you show the worship team your appreciation once again? <laughs> they get here pretty early and practice and practice during the week. Um, you know, there's messages that are sometimes just for our church family. Those so, seem to be more rare than, than ever before. And I know with, um, you know, some of the reports of um, more cases of the virus, um, some of our people are staying home and watching. And um, I, I just want to remind us, if you didn't hear Mark's message Wednesday night on the battle is the Lord's and not to operate in fear, I, I just want to encourage you to go to our website and, um, or our Facebook page and, and listen to that message. It was great. We, we don't want to operate in fear. And if you feel you need to watch from home and you need to avoid crowds, that's fine. If you want to come in here and wear your mask, that's fine too. If you don't want to wear your mask, that's fine too. I'm so sick of the word mask. But anyway, just don't operate in fear. But I would say to this that those are avoiding church. Um, if you're going out to restaurants to eat and not going to church, I, 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 I don't know about that one. I have um, really wrestled with this particular message a little bit more than usual because of the way it was given to me and I feel it, is, it was given to me as what I only can describe as a vision that I had last Sunday when we were worshiping. And um, I say that with um, fear and trembling and, and awness of the Lord because when you step up and say, I had a vision from the Lord or I have a word from the Lord, we, we can't treat that lightly. I'm so glad that we're doing this prophetic class. This is our second one. It'll be the second Sunday of the month following service makes for a long day. The material is free, the food is free, uh, because we want to empower the body of Christ to take out the power gifts into the world where they're needed. We love what happened what happened here with Ruth and all I love when it happens in here. We're not gonna stop doing that, but we're not supposed to keep it in here. Some of you may remember Ian uh, Carroll, who was with us a while back. He's one of the leaders for the Bethel Leaders Network. We were, saw a word of his, and I called him. He's in San Diego, California now. God told him to leave Chicago and move to San Diego, California before the winter hit. Now, that's a word from the Lord. <laughs> or whether it's Ohio to Florida. You know, we, we don't seem to ask for a lot of fleece when we get that one. And he said something very powerful, and I won't go into it. It's, it's up on my Facebook page, so you can watch. It's only 10 minutes. But he said one of the things he said, which I'm, I'm so encouraged because we are, we're already doing it here, is that um, the prophetic ministry, um, God's really going to rise up people from the local church families. That it is not just going to be the ministries and the big names bringing prophetic words to the earth. It's going to be from every believer, just as it is always meant to be. The purpose of the fivefold gift is to equip the saints to do the fivefold ministry. So the apostle is to help you to be apostolic, to go out there, to govern. For the, and when I say govern, that doesn't mean boss, boss people around, but it means to show the more excellent way of the kingdom of God. The pastor is to help you to, to shepherd others that you know and that you love, friends and family and coworkers and so on evangelist is to equip you to evangelize and so on the teacher to teach you how to teach not only teach you and then the prophet is to teach you to be prophetic not everyone will be a fivefold prophet but every believer is called and equipped to be prophetic see Jesus put the kingdom of heaven in every believer so every believer would be heaven on earth and that includes all of the gifts somebody say amen, amen. Um, I just have to, you're going to be, need to be patient with me today because I, I think this is a word that um, is, is for the body of Christ as a whole, and I say that um, with fear and trembling as well. We have more people watching us online from around the world than we ever have before uh, since this all started with the virus in March. But I want to start with the late um, Dave Wilkerson, who was known as an apostle and, and a prophet, had a large four-square church in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, Manhattan, rather, and just a powerful man. And he said this in 1986. He said, I, I see a plague coming on the world and bars 
and church and government will shut down. The plague will hit New York City and shake it like it's never been shaken. Do you know that this is the first time in 88 years they will not light the tree in Rockefeller Center? The plague is going to force prayerless believers into radical prayer and into their Bibles, and repentance will be the cry from the man of God in the pulpit. Watch this now. Out of it will come the great third awakening, and it will sweep America and the world. I am convinced, and I have been saying since this all started, that we are in the beginning stages, and it is growing since the beginning of the year, the third great awakening. If you study revival history, if you study the first two great awakenings, obviously if this is the third, there must be one and two. Genius. <laughs> How does he do it? It was always in great turmoil when the, the world was in a dark, dark place. It was like, man, this is it. This is the end. And God loves to come in to situations that are at their worst, at their darkness. Even a man named Lazarus that was dead for four days, but nothing can stop the light and the life and the power and the revival of Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, and King. And if you believe that, I'd like you to give him a cheer. And if you're watching at home, lift your praise up as well. I have never been, and I'm less interested in church as usual, packing the place in for the sake of crowds. What I am called to do is to build big people in the name of the Lord and send you out to do the work of the ministry because the world needs you. A scared world needs a fearless church. Somebody say amen. In, October, in November, rather, of last year, as we were approaching the end of 2019 and 2020, the Lord gave me a word. Now, of course, a lot of pastors and preachers and prophetic folks were saying, yeah, we're going to have 2020 vision. Well, you know, that's a, a pretty easy one since 2020 is coming, but I still like capturing what's happening in the world and using it for the kingdom. But this is what the Lord gave me. In 2020, the body of Christ is being called and greatly empowered. Let me qualify this again. This is before we knew anything about COVID. This was last November. We didn't even know that disease name. In 2020, the body of Christ will be called and greatly empowered to bring 2020 vision to the lost, causing them to clearly see the reality of God's goodness through the demonstration of heaven's power on the earth. What has been uncommon in the realm of signs, wonders, and miracles will become common. The church will move from being surprised into a culture of perpetual amazement by the exploits of power and authority the Heavenly Father will manifest through His children who are willing to believe and take risk. And we've seen that come to pass here, and I've seen it come to pass in many other churches as I'm connected to the Bethel Leaders Network, and we have these global meetings online and on Zoom, and the reports that we're hearing are just, they're just off the charts. What's happening in the realm of supernatural power touching people's lives. Name the disease. We've seen it here. When the COVID first broke out, there was a woman that was watching in quarantine in her basement from Brooklyn, New York, and we commanded COVID to be healed. And she had the, the, the symptoms really, really bad. She wrote us and said, I felt like I was dying. And then within 45 minutes after I just said yes to that prayer, she was, all the symptoms completely went away. She went and got tested, and they said, we don't, we, you don't have it. You don't have it. You, you don't have it. So we, we either have to believe this thing, and, and, and again, I want to be not trying to be judgmental or, or anything, but the body of Christ, especially in America, we, we have to break out of the performance church, the entertainment church. And, and you know, entertainment's okay, put on your plays, and do, but if that's all we've got, we're not going to be able to out-entertain the world. Amen. We'll have the anointing, we'll have the things that they don't have, but we're not here to out-entertain the world. Amen. We're not here to bring the church into the 21st century so we can relate. 
We're here to bring the kingdom of God into the 21st century, which is relative across the barriers of time. Doesn't matter if it's 1806, 2006, 2026, Jesus Christ is relevant. He's alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Jesus is the answer. He is the only way to heaven. He's the only way to the Father. He's the only way to be born again. Well, isn't Buddha his son and isn't Muhammad his son? If there are other ways to heaven than the Father was unusually cruel to Jesus by sending him to the cross and not anyone else. Jesus is the only one that died, buried, third day rose, ascended into heaven, and then sent his spirit to live in you so you could be the light of the world like he was, moving in power and wonders that causes the world to stop and say, there's only one way that could happen, and it's a God that I may not fully understand, but I have to have what that one has. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Ashley. (laughs) The treasurer will give you that $20 gift certificate (laughs) after service. I'm just kidding. And and, and this is not mean preaching. This is love. Because not to tell people the truth. We don't want to be arrogant. We don't want to be boastful. We don't want to be mean-spirited. But sometimes the truth has to be told in love and we look at someone that has these belief systems and we say, and we do it with kindness. We do it with a tender voice and saying, you know, Jesus is the only one that died and rose again. Well, I don't believe that. Really? I understand. What's, why do you have that cast on your foot? Can I pray? And we watch them get healed and we give Jesus the glory and all of a sudden... There's no argument whether the Bible is true about parting the Red Sea because their Red Sea was parted by you being a demonstration of the miraculous power of heaven invading a life. Jesus in you is the hope of glory. He wants to get out. (laughs) Amen? 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 All right. So now that I've gotten that out of my system, let me just go on here and... I really feel this is just, uh, uh, when I say with fear and trembling, because it's one of those to where I want to present it with the heart and the mind of Christ, but also with integrity. And I think all of us that are learning and moving in the prophetic, you know, in the Old Testament they judge the prophet, in the New Testament they judge the prophecy. It's better to be in the prophetic ministry in the New Testament, by the way. The Old Testament, you know, they they used to saw those guys in half, but um, so I'm glad we're in the New Testament. But my point is we have to, if we miss it, it doesn't mean we're a false prophet if our heart is right. But if we miss it, we don't ignore it. We go back and say, I missed it. I know in part, the Bible says, and I prophesy in part. And I'm just doing my best to share the Father's heart. Because what is the prophetic gift? It is telling people what the Father is saying about them in a need or an area in their life. It's it's a simple thing. What is prophecy? It is God speaking through you something that only they know and God knows, and you're the vessel of bringing that to the light. And it changes their life. It's just as powerful uh, for a non-believer to get healed to hear a word of the Lord as well. How did you know that? Well, sometimes God speaks to me. And when as we learn this over the next few months on the second Sunday and we go out into the community, um, let me just add, add my part. Do it with kindness and humility. Don't be weird on purpose. You don't have to strike a pose and speak in King James. You don't have to corner someone and yell at them, I've got a word from God. <laughs> you know, what I do when the Lord used me this way, I said, excuse me, this may seem odd to you, but I'm a Christian. I I pastor a church in Bradenton, and sometimes the Lord speaks to me about people, and I believe he's speaking to me something for you. Because I'm not ever, I'm not always 100% sure. Sometimes I am, but sometimes I'm not. And I want to be humble enough to admit that. And if I set the stage that way, it brings down a lot of defenses to open the heart of that person. The purpose of the prophetic gift isn't to get a notch in our belt that we just gave another prophecy that was true. It was to help one of his children come out of darkness into his glorious light. Or a prodigal son and daughter to come home. Or a discouraged Christian not to leave in the first place. 
it's all about love. The prophetic word is saying and speaking the heart of the Father in love. And when we do it that way, they're more apt to receive and have their defenses down. So whether it's a miraculous healing, you pray for the sick, whether it's a word of knowledge and prophecy that you give, always ask that most important question. Do you know the Lord? And give them the greatest miracle of all. Amen? Somebody say amen. All right. Well, let me, let me try to get back on course here. Last um, Sunday morning, we were worshiping, and I, I don't remember the, the song we were singing, but as we were singing, I believe it was a slower song, and I had my eyes closed, and I just all of a sudden got this explosive picture that just popped in my mind, and it was a, a, a flat map of the United States with obviously all of the states carved out, like you would see on a flat map. And just like we've seen through the election, you know, some were red and, and some were blue. Some states are known as blue, more blue states than red states, depending on who the leadership is. Right? Red is Republican Party and, and, and blue is the Democratic Party. Did I get that right? And so I, I, I saw this, this map. And then as quickly as it came, it, it went away. And then you went into another song where the chorus is, on earth as it is in heaven. And I just, again, just had already forgotten about what I just saw, and I was just singing that, that chorus with the rest of you. And then all of a sudden, I saw the map again. And I saw this, this wave of gold coming across the country. And I didn't say this last week when I described it to you, but what I also saw was that as the gold was sweeping, there was purple, right? I didn't mention purple last week, that it was just the gold wave. But, but I also saw this purple. And then I received an email with a picture from Renee Fowler. And uh, Renee, are you here? Or are you working with the kids? There's Renee. And Renee, we're so glad the Lord sent you here, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, helping the kids. And so she comes from a more traditional background where all of this stuff that we do, the painting when Angela's in town, all of that, this is all, all new to her, but it's led of the Holy Spirit. So this is a brand new ministry for her. So she, as I was speaking, the Lord gave her a picture. So this is what she painted. Can you see the outline of the U.S. there? You see the gold wave and you see the purple and you see the gold kind of like just infiltrating all of this. Isn't that awesome? Would you give, that's part of the prophetic gift. Isn't that great? Yeah. So as we, as we talk about, you can leave it up just for another moment. As we talk about these things and we, we're not ashamed, um, you know, we, we, we're not the Pentecostal charismatic people on the other side of the tracks, and, and nor do we look down our nose that those that have not embraced it, that's important too. But we carry something that can touch the world. And whether it's a prophetic gift or prophetic painting. So um, Angela's out of town, so are some of our other folk. Um, that's why you'll see her down here painting sometimes. That last painting was done by a little girl that uh, Angela felt that she was supposed to train in this. So let's give the Lord a hand clap for just the freedom that we have here. Okay, you can, you can take that down. Thank you. So the second song came, and, and I saw pretty much what Renee painted. In the Bible, numbers have meaning. In the Bible, colors have meaning. Now, I'm not going to take a lot of time to develop this. You can study it on your own. But for the sake of time, gold, the symbolism of gold in the Bible and the meaning of gold is heaven's glory, heaven's kingship, heaven's foundation. What are the streets? What does it say in Revelation? What are the streets made out of? They're made out of gold. It's the foundation street. It's the, what you walk on. That's your foundation. In the Old Testament, there's the golden altar. It also represents and symbolizes holiness and majesty and righteousness of heaven. And what does heaven want to do? Heaven wants to influence earth. So earth looks like heaven. Amen? Amen. So the color blue in the Old Testament, many believe that represented heaven. You look up, there's three heavens, by the way. There's uh, the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. When you go outside, you look at a blue sky, that's the first heaven. The second heaven is, is deep space, the stars and the, and, and the cosmos and all of the. Then there's the third heaven, which should be our favorite heaven because that's where the throne room is. And when Jesus said to pray, thy kingdom come on earth 
as it is in heaven, he's talking about the third heaven. However, colors have meaning, so they would look at blue and they'd say, well, that represents heaven. And red would represent earth, earthly, you know, like red clay. Some states, you know, the, the dirt is actually a reddish color. Well, if you're a little kid and you're painting and you have primary colors, there's something prophetic in that statement in regards to politics. If you take those two primary colors and mix them, what color do you get? So purple does not only represent royalty, it represents heaven on earth. When they mocked him and took him to the cross, what color was his robe? Because the act of the cross was the beginning of bringing heaven to earth for everyone. Everybody say something to me, I'm getting nervous. It's getting too quiet, all right. <laughs> all right. So this is what the Lord is, is showing me with this vision. And I believe some of this has already begun. Number one, unprecedented. Somebody say unprecedented. Unprecedented uni in the, unity in the body of Christ. And we're seeing that more than before, at least I am. I'm seeing cross-denominational stuff just happening. I was talking to a local pastor, um, Mark Alt of The Bridge, and, and I just so love him. And he does ministry much different than we do it here. But we were just talking on the phone. He was, man, he goes, I'm celebrating what God's doing there. And, and, what, and he started naming different ministries. I'm just so glad the kingdom of God is moving and, and there's a unity here. And he was declaring it and he's seeing it. We want to talk about that. Not what they're not doing, what that they're not, you know, well, if they only had that, that. We have to stop that rhetoric. That's just gives the devil authority and power because we're agreeing with him with the language of disunity and criticism. This on. <laughs> Number one, unprecedented unity in the body of Christ. Number two, and I believe the unity in the body of Christ has already started in a major way. These worship events that Sean Foyt is doing in these cities, thousands of people coming, do you, do you think they're all Assembly of God? They're all Church of God from Tennessee? No, they're not. They're, they're from every, every background that, that's coming to worship seems to break down the walls of division. Because when the presence comes, we stop caring about what denominational label you have or what political label you have, and that's what brings heaven to earth, at least one of the ways. So number two, unity in our government is coming. My hope is that we are going to see an unprecedented move of unity in our government in the United States like we've never seen. I'm not declaring it's 2021. I, I believe this vision represents unity in government like we've never seen. I'm convinced of that. I'm hoping it happens in 2021. Has everybody got that? So I'm not predicting Jesus is coming on March 2nd and uh, 2.30, so, you know, give me your Cadillac because he's coming again. Yeah, I'm not going to do any of that stuff. But what I am saying, I am convinced the vision that God gave me is a prophetic picture of unity to come because it's not going to be about red. It's not going to be about blue. It's going to be about purple, and that is heaven on earth. And there's gonna, doesn't mean we're not going to have the parties. It means they're going to work together differently. Now, let me just say this about that, and I'll say this now. When it is the darkest, God shows up. Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. Let me just give you a familiar scripture. Isaiah chapter 60, just three verses. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory, what does gold represent? Glory. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. Watch this, and deep darkness the people. Deep darkness. Would you say that the world's in deep darkness right now? But the Lord will arise over who? Over you. That's what the Bible says. The, but the Lord will arise over you. You are designed for this moment in history. Don't hide at home. Don't hide in the corner. This is what the devil wants. Do what you have to do where you feel you're using wisdom to keep yourself healthy, but don't operate in fear. We don't want to allow the devil to take our light and put a bushel on top of it. 
Arise and shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you. Watch this. And his glory will be seen upon you. Well, if you're not going to give me a hallelujah after that one, I don't know what we got to do. Verse 3 says, the Gentiles, which are the unbelievers, shall come to your light. And the kings, which are leaders, governmental leaders, political leaders, company leaders. It's leaders in every area of influence on the earth. Those are the kings. They're going to come to our rising because they want to know why we're not freaking out, why our churches are still doing well, how did we make it through financially. We've had one of our best years this year because of the generosity of you in a time where we weren't allowed to meet for the first three months. Because nothing, somebody yell out, nothing. Nothing can stop the advancement of the kingdom of God. For the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Amen? So we have this opportunity now to declare this truth. Number three, an unprecedented revival nationwide. And that has already begun. And if you're still praying for revival to come, I, I don't know how any other way to say it except just watch what's happening around the earth. The kings are coming to the king. He's the king of kings. And the rulers of the earth are going to bow their knee. The Bible already says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's not going to be some forced thing. That's not going to be done through legislation and a law. That's going to be as his presence shines in greater, greater, and greater power. And on the culmination of his final return, there's only going to be one thing to do. That's Jesus. He's Lord. Just like the centurion when he saw him die said, this must be the Son of God. You guys with me? We looked at this briefly to start our service last week, but let's take a couple of minutes and work our way through it. If you would bring up Psalm 138, verses 1 and 2, and 3, and 4, and 5, 1 through 5. I thank you, Lord, with all the passion of my heart. I will worship you in the presence of angels. Now, let me just stop right there. We're going to do five verses, Hilliard, and this is in the Passion. When you do what you did today, you're in the presence of heaven and the presence of angels. You are not singing with just the people that are in this room. And we have to get this mindset of the American performance praise and worship machine that it's not that at all. It is a congregation, the church family, the family of God, the household of faith that's gathering around the throne, the audience of one, the Father, the most holy Father, and we're singing to him out of gratitude and praise and thanksgiving for all he's done, all he will do, and the things that are yet to come. And when I don't feel like lifting my voice, I lift my voice by faith. And when I begin to step in and I begin to press in for that, all of a sudden those things that were trying to hold me down, they just can't stay with me any longer because there's something greater than the problem, and that is praise, worship the king because that makes those things fall off. Amen? Amen. I thank you, Lord, with all the passion of my heart. I will worship you in the presence of angels. Heaven's mighty ones will hear my voice as I sing my loving praise to you. Verse 2, I bow down before your divine presence and bring my deepest worship as I experience your tender love and your living truth. For the promises of your word and the fame of your name have been magnified above all else. Now let's tie in these last two verses into the vision that I saw. Verse 3, at the very moment I called out to you, you answered me, you strengthened me deep within my soul and you breathed fresh courage in me. So this gives us the courage. When we worship, we worship out of intimacy. But we also have heaven as an audience. We also have the one that sits on the throne as an audience. And then we are filled with power, might, and courage. Now, verse 4. One day, everybody say one day. I believe we are on the beginning stages of that day. This was written thousands of years ago, but it says one day. Why can it not be in our day? Why can it not be this generation? Why can it not be now? Why not here? Why not us? Why not now? Say that back with me. Why not here? Why not now? And why not us? Let me read it to you. 
Verse 4, one day all the kings of the earth, how many kings? All the kings of the earth. One day all the kings of the earth will rise and give you thanks when they hear the living words that I have heard you speak. Well, how are they going to hear them? When we sing, when we share, when we share our faith, something that God has done. But it is not just in the natural ear, when we sing the way we sing. When I preach the way we preach, whether we're going live around the world on the internet or not, it goes beyond into the atmosphere of heavens and it begins to touch hearts. Before their natural ear can hear, their heart ear will hear and they might not know why they're being drawn to want to go to church, why they're, not being, draw, why they're being drawn to open up the Bible. When when you sing, when you praise, when you declare, even if it's in your living room by yourself, it is echoing out through the corners of the earth and is touching lives and bringing them out of darkness into your glorious light. Your singing, your praise, your shout, your hand clapping will bring people into the kingdom of God that you will never know about till you cross over that door that John saw standing open in heaven. And there are going to be people there that are going to be there because of your influence. We want to share our faith one-to-one, -on -one, but don't underestimate your praise. Don't underestimate your worship. And some of you that have the giftings of some of our, our folks up here, man, you just need to go places and just sing. You need to do mini Sean Voigt deals. Just go somewhere and sing it out. Amen. If they come and get you, Dave will bail you out. <laughs> We'll take out a bail you out love offering for you. Verse 4 and 5, and I'll move on. One day all the kings of the earth will rise to give you thanks, and they will hear the living words that, you have, that I have heard you speak. They too will sing of your wonderful ways, for your infallible glory is great. You can take that down. Guys okay for a little bit? Now that the introduction is over, the message title is One Holy Nation Under God. Say that back to me. One Holy Nation Under God. One Holy Nation is not a place. It's a people. Let me say that again. A holy nation, one holy nation is not a place. It's not geographical. It's a people. Where does heaven reside? kingdom of heaven is within you, Jesus said. The glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Well, how does that happen? We're all, we're all over the earth, and Christ in us is the hope of that glory. So we cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Now, you can disagree with me with that theology. That's okay. Your theology's been wrong before. If this is truly a prophetic vision, we have to war for it. One holy nation under God is not a place, it's a people. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I have Bible for that. But you are a chosen generation. But you are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. What does it say? All right, let's read this out loud with a loud voice. One, two, three. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim, watch this, let's read on, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So we circle back to the praise so the kings of the earth can hear us in the spirit. So if this is truly a prophetic vision, which I submit to you is, we have to war for it. If this is a word outside of the Kingdom Life Bradenton Church family, we have to war for it. 1 Timothy chapter 1.18, this charge I commit to you, son, Timothy, Paul is speaking here, according to the prophecies made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. I believe Ian Carroll's word is true. He went on to say that the sum of, well, let me not give you that part. You watch that 10-minute word. It's on my Facebook page. But he said, the Lord is rising up prophetic voices all throughout the local churches. 
So we have to get out of our mind that unless it's some sort of famous ministry, which is fine, I'm not against those, but it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be 20,000 people. It can be a small group of people in Bradenton, Florida, that's believing the word that the man of God gave us, Steve Witt, that said, we're Grand Central Station, and God's going to touch the earth through this, and we have a smaller group this week than two weeks ago that when he gave us the word. Why? In some part, some of our folks are traveling. In some part, some people are fearful and not coming. And those are the ones that have to worship him so you get that breath of courage back in you to go back out into a world that's lost and dying and needs you. One of the most profound, striking pictures of 9-11 for me, and there's so many, and I'm not downplaying any of them, was the chaplain, because I'm a police chaplain too, was the chaplain for the fire department, a priest, who rushed out to where it was all happening. And the last picture, one of the last pictures of him was being carried on a stretcher because he was killed by debris or something. But he didn't hide. He ran in to where he was needed because he carries something that's greater than himself. Comfort, Christianity, is from hell. These messages, by the way, don't pack them out. (laughs) But what they should do is challenge us to make a difference, to reach people I'll never see. Amen? All right, so we have to wage good warfare. Okay, just a couple of points, and and I'm going to get through this as quickly as possible. So please be patient with me because this is important. All right, so we see the red and the blue, and it comes together. That's purple and the gold, the majesty of God, the kingly majesty, the rule of Christ, the foundation of Christ, sweeping our nation, bringing unity to the body of Christ, unity to all leaders, not just political, and the sweeping greatest revival the world has ever seen, according to the 1986 prophecy of Dave Wilkerson. Okay, so that's just a real quick recap before we go into these things that we're called to do. And there's more, and maybe we'll keep this going next week. Number one. The body of Christ must choose what citizenship comes first. Let me say that again. The body of Christ must choose what citizenship comes first. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So my question is, are you an American that's a Christian, or are you a Christian that's an American? I'm just waiting for a stone to come flying up here at any, at any moment. The best way you can serve your nation is put your heavenly citizenship first. Because if you're an American first, then you are going to war earth to heaven instead of heaven to earth. And when you war from heaven to earth, you're going to have a lot more victories. But when one candidate or another candidate makes you hate a brother who's for the other candidate, that is not Christ. That is the devil, and that is division, and that's what he wants to do to the body of Christ. At least one person agrees. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where turning the other cheek is the kingdom. This is where we love those that we disagree with. The best way to serve your nation is from heavenly places where you're seated in Christ. Ephesians 2, 6, and he has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 1 and 2, if then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind. Somebody say, set your mind. What needs to be healed in the body of Christ is between our two ears. Renewing of the mind. Set your mind to things above, not on things of the earth. Number two, the body of Christ must make disciples by first demonstrating what a true disciple is. <laughs> I, I, could, I could use an amen, David, any, any, any time. It's lonely up here this morning. Every disciple of Christ is a Christian. But not every Christian is a disciple. Salvation is a free gift. Discipleship is expensive. And you are called to pay the price. Jesus prayed, paid the price so you could go to heaven when you die. You have to pay the price to bring heaven to the earth for a world that's in need. <laughs> so what is a real disciple? Number one is love. John 
13, 35, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. I, I'm just telling you right now, and I, I planned on saying this a couple of days ago, I love all of you, but some of you, I'm going to stop following you on Facebook because of the arrogant ugliness of political meanness. I don't want to see it anymore. That's not Christ. I care more about his heart than how many people are going to stay a part of this ministry. I, I, I just mean it. I, I just, I'm, I've hit this place in my life where I want, I want heaven on earth. I want to be like Jesus, and I want the people that are listening to what I'm teaching and preaching to be like Jesus more than any other agenda in their life because that's what's going to change the world. We're the, life, we're the world changers. The world needs real Christians, not arrogant ones, not mean ones. So we have to make disciples by being a real disciple. So if I, well, let me not go on any more than that. John 13, 35, in the passion, for when you demonstrate the same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you're my true followers. So are you a Democrat or Republican that's a Christian, or are you a Christian that's a Republican or a Democrat? You know, he died for both sides of the aisles. Bad news for you. I, I, this just, you may, most of you agree, and I think we can't argue with the Bible, and I'm not saying we don't stand for those that are standing for righteousness, but I'm saying that the way we stand for it is not always Christ-like. It's ugly. And it has to stop. It, it, it does. I vote according to Scripture and who stands for the things of righteousness. I, I've done that every election. But when others have come into office that I didn't vote for, when they gave their, when they were sworn as, as president, they became my president and I began to pray for them, their family, their safety, their wisdom of decisions and for them to come to Christ. Listen, this is important for pulpits to talk about. We don't vote according to our heart. We don't vote according to conscience. I believe, at least my opinion, is we vote according to Scripture. But the way we promote that is we promote it according to Scripture, and it's always love. Amen. The greatest of these is love. Amen? Amen. <laughs> you coming back next Sunday? I, I, sure, I, I sure hope so. Number one, it's love. To be a true disciple, and this is another... Look, I, I know these are the tough messages the last couple of weeks, but I'm... I'm trying to help us grow. Number two is holy living. Romans 6, 22, but now as God's loving servants, you are to live joyous freedom from the power of sin. So consider the benefits now you enjoy. You are brought deeper into the experience of true holiness that ends with eternal life. If Jesus said the things that I do, you will do an even greater. That doesn't only include the miracle signs and wonders. That includes getting on our knees and being broken and delivered from past behavior that doesn't represent Christ. I am not satisfied with going to heaven when I die, when I can also have heaven on earth while I live. And that also calls me to stand and walk in righteousness. I need to study the scriptures for myself so I know how to live and not live. And I make a stand, and I do it in love, I do it in strength, I do it in humility, but I make this stand so I can be more empowered. Sin is not only not doing the things that are wrong, sin is also doing the things that are right. And this is the great sacrifice of being a Christian. Real, <laughs> I, I, I've made this joking statement before. I said, if, if Jesus filled out a resume to be the pastor of some churches in America without saying it was Jesus, they wouldn't hire him. Grab an ear and say, Lord Jesus, give me spirit ears to hear. The pressure and the temptation to apologize right now is great, but I shall not. Because this is the truth. And it's the truth that sets us free. And I've been pressing in for this for 35 years. And I like to say, I'm not there yet. I want more. Amen. Don't you? Yeah. Do you have loved ones, yeah. friends, and neighbors, and coworkers that are on their way to hell because they don't know Jesus? Well, you're the one that they're going to know. You're the one that they're going to see the true Christ. You're the one that's going to preach the sermon by the way you live. You don't think they're watching? 
You know, we go, I, look, I get it. You're a new convert. You just came to Christ. You're only a few months old. You're still working out the kinks. I came out of great darkness, and it, it took me a little while to work out the kinks. And you know what? I'm still working out my salvation. But some of the gross sins that are clear in the Bible, I, they don't even come close to tempting me anymore because I'm too busy demonstrating heaven on earth to even worry about that because that's a much better high. The most high is a better high than that high. Amen? So after you've been a Christian a while, you've been around this for a while, and you can, I'm just going to live any way I want. That, that's, not help, that's not only not helping you, it's deterring other people from coming to Christ. When you say, I go to this church, I do that, and I you know, do this, and they watch the way you live with no conviction, no pressing in for holiness, no honesty saying, wow, you know what, I shouldn't have done that. There was a time when I was a youth pastor, and um, I was in my mid-20s. I used to go to this health club, and I, I just got in an argument with the, the woman that was checking us in. And, and it, it was a silly thing. I was just not in a great mood. And, man, I just, I just let her have it. It was just ugly. And I was a youth pastor. I had a large youth group of a couple of hundred people. And it was when I was leaving the, 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 the um, fitness club, as I was walking out to my car, this woman just started following me. She goes, you're the, past, you're the youth pastor down da-da-da-da-da. She goes, that's the type of stuff that's pushing people away from Christ. You should be ashamed of yourself. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> I started to cry, and then I got myself together. I walked back in there and say, that's not the way a Christian is supposed to behave, let alone a youth pastor. I ask for your forgiveness. And she said, oh, it's okay. I guess you were having a bad day. And all of a sudden, this confrontational conversation, it totally softened because I humbled myself and asked for forgiveness. She came to Harvest Temple where I was the youth pastor. She gave her life to the Lord. She still lives for Christ and we're still friends on Facebook 30 years later. Because I just simply said I'm sorry for not being a nice Christian. Not one of my favorite testimonies to give the church family. But if it'll help you, I'm glad to give it. Number three, power and authority. I talked about that last week. Uh, I'm going to go into this a little bit deeper, but for the sake of time, I'll finish this later. We must be a people of hope, and we must take action. We have to repent. We have to worship. We have to pray for our leaders. We have to go out and share. You know, Pastor Phil mentioned the, these cards. You know what? I'd love to see all of these cards gone off the table, and, and you take them home, and you lay hands on them. Maybe you anoint them with oil a little bit, and you just pray for the anointing to be on them. And then you ask God, who should I invite to come play on the playground? Who should I invite to the Christmas service? Little things like that that you do, and they come, and they ask, their, they ask the Lord into their heart. I'd like you to stand, and, and Joseph, if you could help me out, I would appreciate it. <laughs> My wife has been with me we've been married it'll be 33 years in March give her a hand for crying out loud that's <laughs> well, the Pope called yesterday already made her a saint because he he heard that it's making that up. I leaned over to her today as I do so many Sundays and I take her hand and I say would you would you pray for me for my message and she squeezes my hand and she always says a prayer she's been doing it for years I've never shared this publicly. Today I said, I really need you to pray for me. This is a tough one for me. It's just a tough one. I, I love the body of Christ. I love the lost. I love our church family, those of you that are new and those of you that have been coming for a while. But I love the Lord first. He's my first love. And He wants you to be a powerful vessel of revival. He wants you to be a hope dealer. He he wants you to live righteously and, and forsake the sinful life, not because it's something bad, because it causes you to miss the mark and not have the better life. The reason why he says no to some things is so you'll have a, a better life. You won't have all of the heartache uh, of living that life. And it's harder to live that bad life when you've accepted him because you can no longer truly live it in clear conscience. And that's torture itself. So I'm going to ask you to do one thing before you go, and I'm going to ask everybody that would participate, and those of you that are watching online, you can take a step out. I know we've already come forward, but I really feel there needs to be a commissioning before we go, and I just want to pray over you. 
to be a disciple, to go out into the world. Be proud of your candidate. Be proud of whatever that leader might be in business and all of these things. Just don't put them before God. And that when you promote it, do it in love and not arrogance or meanness. I mean, we have a lot of turmoil even with the election results. I'm praying and binding injustice, loosing justice with the keys of the kingdom because that's what Jesus said. That's how he told me to pray. So if you would come forward, I just want to pray for you. Let's move forward a little bit more. And I just want to pray a blessing over you and strength over you. I think this is an important hour. I think after I have my lunch today, I'm going to eat dessert. (laughs) I need cake after this one. You're you're the hope. You're the hope. You carry the hope of glory within you. Let's move a little bit this way because there's more people that I just feel supposed to should come down. Pilate, who held Jesus' life in his hands, at least he thought, said, uh, are you a king? I said, I am. But it's not of this world. You're kings and priests. You're sons and daughters. And your citizenship is first and foremost not of this world. Doesn't mean that we don't honor government and laws and so on, as long as they don't go against scripture. We do. We want to serve. I'm 12 years now being the chaplain of the Braden PD put many, many hours. I'm a local missionary as Amber is. And your gifts and tithes and offerings that help me to do this full time along with everything else and the expenses allow me to be at the police station on a regular basis. This, the three new gals that are going to be sworn in. I'm the beginning. I'm the first part of the ceremony and the last part of the ceremony. And I bless them and speak Jesus freely wearing a police uniform with a gold shield that says Pastor Bradington Police Department. That's on earth as it is in heaven. Someday I'll, I'll wear my uniform when I preach because it'll, it'll just make a, a visual point. But all of you are officers of heaven. All of you have jurisdiction down here. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So Father, I just, you know, I've done my best to deliver and explain what I saw in that vision and, and what I believe it means. And, and a word that challenges us and should bring us great conviction. So Father, I, I start with myself. I pray the prayer of David. Search my heart, O God. King David, the King of Israel said, search my heart, O God, and reveal any wicked way within me. Show me what I have to change. Reach deep into these temples that are not our own. Reach deep into these temples that are not our own and apply a holy heart massage and spark revival in us, spark revival. And I just pray, Father, for a conviction of lifestyles that need to change, a sinful practice that people know they just have not for whatever reason, been able to let go. I just pray and I break that in the name of Jesus with the power that's in the name of Jesus so they can function in greater measure for you. It's not a guilt thing. It's it's not a shame thing. It's just molding ourselves and working out our salvation to be more like Jesus. Now I pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit to touch people that have never received it before and a fresh filling for everyone that's in this room. Fill our mouths, Lord God, with words of love, wisdom, and words with mighty power and courage, knowing when to be as a lion and when to be as a lamb so we can slay the Goliaths of injustice that are on the earth in Jesus' name. Use us as evangelists. Use us to be prophetic, to be apostolic, to be pastoral, to teach. Even if our congregation is that one person at work that we have a lunch with once a week and talk about the Bible so father I declare and believe that this is a vision you've given me for the earth so we just bind and we 
break division in government. And this hatred cannot keep going. We cannot continue this hatred. So I pray, Father God, for you to sweep over the earth in an unprecedented way and go through the walls of the White House all the way to the local courthouse and everyone on both sides of the aisle, Lord God, and everyone that's in leadership from just county district and city councils and mayors uh, from, from sea to shining sea of this great nation. And we would be one holy nation of people, Lord God a people that was not a people but now are the people of God just lift your hands just begin to lift your hands and just just begin to acknowledge begin to repent if you need to repent begin to ask for change come on church let's leave here different let's leave here ignited let's leave here empowered like we were never before baptize us in love baptize us in power those of you that have your spirit language, just begin to intercede for the nation. Just begin to pray in the spirit. See that gold coming over the red states. See that gold coming over the blue states, turning into purple on earth as it is in heaven. One holy nation under God. Come, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Come on, lift it up. We're interceding now for a nation. Hallelujah. We pray for every political leader. We pray for every corporate leader, small to large, that has influence, those in entertainment, those making movies. We pray for a worldwide, nationwide revival in every sphere of influence, on every mountain, on every kingdom of this world, that the kingdoms of this world would become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ. Oh, let heaven come. Let thy kingdom come. Let thy kingdom come on the earth in the United States of America as it is in heaven. We're humbling ourselves according to your word. Heal our land, O oh Lord, cry out to him. Heal the United States. Heal this hatred. Heal this divide in the name of Jesus. Strengthen the believers to walk in love, to walk in righteousness and holiness in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my all the day. Lift your voice. on the shoulder of the person next to you and just bless them with a blessing. Bless them with a... Let's, we'll call this blessing blast. Just bless them. We bless you. We bless your health. We bless your body. We bless your mind. We bless your finances. We bless your relationship in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Those that are watching online, we bless you. We bless you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. We used to call it discipleship training. It's changed to Wednesday night wildfire just because it's what's happening. Saturday women's group. Make sure you get those cards. I love you. I love this church. Let's get out there and give them heaven. Have an awesome Sunday.